Hey, good morning, Eagle Song Gardener here at Ravencroft Garden. Today we're gonna to take a, a little tour of the Triskeel Garden, a 10 minute tour. We'll try to keep it to 10 minutes. This is our main production garden for vegetables, but as you can see, we also have herbs and flowers in this garden as well. So I'm gonna do a outside the perimeter and just talk to you a little bit about the garden. And then we'll go inside and look at some of the specific details that are in this garden. So this garden has been in place for 29 years. It's morphed through many different transformations as we've grown and changed through time here at Ravencroft. The gardens definitely reflect things as they change. So this is now a, a garden that is well, triskeel is a word that implies movement, and really in 29 years, this garden has moved uh, a lot, even though the soil remains steady and each year gets more nutrient dense. You can see Catkin there having a walk in the garden this morning. So we've got a lot of sunflowers here, beautiful sunflowers. I think most of these are self-sown. Sally tends the triskeel garden, and really does a fine job of keeping a beautiful integration of flowers, herbal medicine, plants, and vegetables coming to our table and to our apothecary um, each year. So I'm gonna take a little back up here and give you a bigger overview of it. The garden is about, oh, say 40 feet in diameter. It's a circle and it's definitely filled with tremendous variety of plants and as you can see there's a lot of flowers it's early morning here it's august oh i don't know 18th i think and we're just at that time of year where the um, everything is in fulfillment all of the plants are just really um, ah they're satisfied look at that rich color beautiful, full. Everything looks quite different in the spring than it does at this time of the year. And so it's really fun to actually have an integration of animals, plants, thousands, millions, billions, trillions even, microbes in the soil, learning to dance with microbes or what Linnaeus called chaos because he knew something was beyond what he could see a name, but he didn't have a word for it or a name for it. He could feel it was out there and what he called it was chaos. And truthfully, that is what we're dealing with in COVID times, is it not? The chaos of being a part of something bigger than ourselves and the excitement of that at the same time. So let's go into the Trist Keel Garden and we'll take a look at some of the things in a little bit more detail. One of them is this plant, which I totally love, and we grow every year. People are afraid of, of morning glories, but this Grandpa Otz is an heirloom morning glory and really quite a spectacular thing to see, isn't it? In fact, Grandpa Otz has taken over the tiny rake and now it will be left until <laughs> Late fall, when the frost comes in, the rake is released to our use again. You can see here that Catkin enjoys uh, the, her time in the garden as well. So we have plants that live in the vegetable realm, like this zucchini, uh, Chinese chrysanthemum, echinacea, probably one of the most well-known herbs from er the herbal world, echinacea, uh, really nice blooming lamb's quarters. You can see here the leaves and the, um, the flowers. The lamb's quarter seed is actually ripening right here. And we will be scattering this seed throughout this garden so that it continues to perpetuate by, well, somewhat self-sowing with a little intervention. Borage for courage. Uh, kale, we have the spring planting of kale here and the fall planting of kale here. 
The spring planting will take us through winter and the fall planting will kick in in the spring and take us into early summer until new plants are put in. Onions, behind the onions are self-heal. This is a volunteer self-heal inside the Triskeel fence. It actually grows quite large. Outside the fence, not so big. I think the geese actually like it. So here again, another, another self-heal. So ashwagandha, lavender. We're just going to name the plants today. We're not going to really talk about what they do. We've got uh, Tulsi basil here. This will probably go into a honey today. And we've got uh, great um, onions, sweet basil, again, those beautiful sunflowers. And as they, uh, their seeds ripen and their petals fall, the small wrens and birds come. So the garden is not just for us. The garden is actually for a lot of animals and birds. And this three-dimensional trellising really helps to bring a lot of those flying friends into the garden. And there's something here for them to eat. It's not just a stopover, but actually a restaurant for them. Calendulas. This is calendula that's been self-sowing here for the last five years, but the seed has been carried along for the last 30 years in different gardens I've tended through time. Oh, and there's been a lot of them. All right, here's beans, dry beans. This is Rockwell, um, another heirloom bean. We're just trying it this year. We've never grown it before. Sally took a liking to the bean and the, the pods are ready for harvesting. So when it dries out today, we'll be gathering these in. Nasturtiums, excellent in the salad and also make a dynamite vinegar. Uh, runner beans, now this is a bean that really exemplifies our desire to bring food to the table as through as many growing cycles as a plant can offer. So we eat the flowers, we eat the green beans, we eat shelling beans as they mature in the pod, and then those that are left beyond that we actually use as dry beans in the winter. All right, all right, sweet peas. Yay, sweet peas. Wish you could smell them. Um, they're really a nice addition to the garden and they bring a lot of joy into the house with a, what I would call um, a therapeutic scent therapy that we, we enjoy a lot. Bob's Italian beans, up close, they have a very small flower. Uh, not too too much going on in the flower there, but the bean itself is very meaty, really delicious and wonderful to eat. We use most of them as dry beans. We let these beans grow on the vine. Here you can see one of the pods under here. And that is the plant that we enjoy as dry beans in our kitchen over the winter. Marshmallow, a grand marshmallow, is actually the heart of the garden, that cooling, soothing herb, a great place for it. Here we've got celery. Now when you grow celery in a garden, at least here in western Washington, we never get the big stalks that you would get at the grocery store, that kind of celery. But what we do get is an amazing seasoning. Most of the leaves of this celery go in soups and stews and are dried for winter use. Leeks, really great leeks here. Now remember, this garden is just 40 feet across and it's a round garden. So it's not that much space. It's, 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 you could do this at any size, 10, 20, 30, 40 feet, whatever you like, and still have amazing diversity. Here we have curly parsley. Again, this will be dried and it's used constantly as a fresh green added to soups and stews. Here's a leaf a brassica, a leaf cabbage. And this is a self-sowing one. You can see the seed pods have already uh, matured and have opened. So these plants are setting the stage for next year's garden. We have a little cucumber here. We're into our ninth minute, so we're gonna wrap it up here. And just a look at the beautiful beans. So beans, squash, we, we don't grow corn. Our, our ground is not really suitable for corn, but beans and squash, not only do they feed us in the summer, they carry 
are eating into the fall and winter as well. I can now see why beans, corn, and squash, or beans and squash and any kind of grain would be a wonderful food for um, the, the core, the heart of your diet. Again, Eagle Song Gardener here in the Trisk Keel Garden at Ravencroft, enjoying flowers, herbs, vegetables, and scent, all in an integrated garden that's been tended over 20 nine years. Come see us at eaglesong-gardener.com and enjoy the ever-expanding garden. See you there.